I'd like to welcome everybody to our event this afternoon. My name is Jerry Lynch. I'm the Department Chair of Civil and Environmental Engineering here at the University of Michigan. And it's a great honor to have everybody online today for our event. I'd like to first introduce our distinguished lecture series, Building the Future. In 2017, our department embarked on a two year long process uh, visioning what the future of the fields of civil and environmental engineering will be. Part of that process resulted in a strategic vision that we published in 2019. And including the strategic vision were five strategic directions. The first one was habitat experiences, particularly looking at people and how people experience their built and natural environments and ensuring that they have a high quality of life. The second was shaping resource flows, looking at a variety of resources as they move through our built and natural environments and ensuring the sustainability of our built habitats for the future. The third was adaptation, thinking about adaptation strategies, particularly as we're facing complex challenges associated with climate change. The fourth is autonomy, looking at ways that automation and automated services are impacting our field and the infrastructure services that we provide to society. And the fifth is strategic is smart infrastructure financing. And what we've done is we've essentially identified for each of these strategic areas, one speaker that can speak as a visionary to what this particular direction is about. So today we're excited that our speaker and corresponding panel will be focused on autonomy and looking at the future of autonomy as we think of infrastructure and infrastructure services and ways that we manage our natural environments as civil and environmental engineers. So the Building the Future lecture series really is designed to highlight each of these strategic areas. And as I mentioned, today we'll be focused on autonomy. Not only do these uh, Building the Future lectures uh, provide an opportunity to explore what the future of these strategic areas are, but it's also a platform for us as an academic community to engage other stakeholders, including industry professionals, other researchers from across the globe, as well as students in our programs. We're aiming through this lecture series to identify ways to break down barriers that also exist between innovation that may be occurring within our labs and transitioning that innovation into the field. So through the presentations from leading experts and the panel discussions that will follow, we're hoping to glean new insights to how we can do that. So before uh, passing the baton to my colleague, Professor Bronco Kirk has, um, I'd like to acknowledge what it took for us to get here today. First, I'd like to thank the co-sponsors of today's event, and there were two, the Clean Water Services, as well as the Water Environment Federation. And we're grateful for their support um, and contributions to this lecture series and today's event. I'd like to also thank the Strategic Implementation Committee that's been led by Professor Sang Yun Lee. They've been the driving force behind the organization of this distinguished lecture series. Specifically from that committee, I'd like to highlight the contributions of my colleague, Professor Bronco Kirkes, who's an associate professor here in the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering. And Professor Kirkes has graciously agreed to serve as the panel moderator in the panel sessions that will follow uh, Al's talk. Uh, just a quick word about accessibility. We wanna make sure that this event is accessible to all participants. This webinar will have live automated captions and a transcript will be available after the talk. So if you're interested in looking at the live transcript as, it, as the event proceeds, uh, please choose on the viewing option, live transcript that exists on the control bar at the bottom of your screen. And you can essentially show or hide the subtitles or view view uh, of the transcript as the event unfolds. So without much further ado, I'm going to now uh, hand it over to my colleague, Professor Bronco Kirkes, who's going to introduce our distinguished lecturer this afternoon. Bronco. Uh, thank you, Dr. Lynch. Um, thanks also again to Jessica and Joyce for helping us um, continually get here and, and support us on this. So um, thanks for everybody for being here. Um, big thanks also to our distinguished speaker and panelist um, uh, for, for spending time um, with us today. I think it's safe to say we have like the who's who in the water industry here today, um, both both with our speaker and our panelists. So we're really excited to, um, to see them here and hear their viewpoints. I'm gonna introduce them in just a little bit, but just to provide a little bit more context for the strategic areas that uh, Dr. Lynch was mentioning, we're gonna cue it off. I believe Rebby is gonna show us a video specifically on the autonomy section to provide the department's viewpoint. And then we're excited to hear from the um, panelists um, afterwards. Thank mm -hmm. you. 
Automation is becoming pervasive in our daily lives, from smart homes to self-driving cars, and now's the time to answer the question of what are these technologies actually going to do for municipalities? So we believe that autonomy is the next frontier for society. We're seeing connected transportation systems that basically know where cars are, they can predict accidents and route people to safety during disasters. We're seeing smart water systems that control themselves in response to changing conditions. We're seeing robots that are gonna build the cities of the future entirely on their own. And that doesn't just include automated construction, but it includes the sourcing of the materials and the various processes in between. And we're even going to see new sensors that are going to be carried by construction workers to promote safety on construction sites. So we're looking forward to a future where autonomy isn't just robotics. It's a future where the various sharing of information and data allows cities to create safer and more equitable environments for their residents. Thank you. I watched that video ahead of time to make sure I don't wear the same outfit again. Um, okay, that is, our, that is our viewpoint that we've been um, thinking about in terms of autonomy. Now we're really excited to, uh, to hear from our industry colleagues and leaders, frankly. So what I'll do is I'll briefly introduce them and then we'll, we'll go ahead and get going. So our distinguished uh, lecturer today is uh, Albert Alcho. He's a senior VP at Xylem, um, a massive water technology company globally. He's both the uh, chief strategy officer and the uh, chief digital officer. I'll just defer you to his bio for you to see the various um, um, accomplishments he has. You can read that in detail. But I'd just like to point out to the students the variety of his career tracks, which included both providing advice to the White House, um, a stint in consulting industry, working in the tech industry, um, and now he's in Xylem. So uh, we're excited to hear from him. Um, also, our panelists today, we have Dr. Ting Lu, who is the bi business practice leader at Clean Water Services, uh, frankly, one of the most innovative utilities um, that, that we're aware of. Uh, and uh, it, we're just really excited to have her here. She is an international visionary in this field, and in, the, in, in particular with uh, the smart water systems, and it's used in high demand internationally for panels and committees and all sorts of service that she provides to community. So we're really excited to have um, her here. Uh, she also had uh, some prior work, again, for the students in consulting before she went to, um, to work with the utility and, um, from that perspective. And then um, we have Dr. Barry Liner here. He's the uh, CTO, Chief Technical Officer at uh, WEF. And, uh, for those of you who work in water, you know what WEF is, but if, if you don't, if you're from another field, they put on the largest water quality conference in the world, WEF Tech, and he helps connect all the individuals to make that happen every year. He also has an interesting background. He spent some time um, within universities and consulting. Um, and again, I'm just providing that context for the students to see the various viewpoints that we're gonna have represented here. I think the thing I'll say about Barry is he literally seems to know everybody. Um, so when you travel all around the world to some conference, you're not just going to run into somebody who knows Barry, but you're probably going to run into Barry. And so he is, he just knows lots of people. And we're excited to hear from him as well and, and all of his perspective. So with that in mind, um, we're going to go ahead and pass it over to the speaker for his presentation. That's going to be followed by question and answer session. Um, a lot of you have already submitted questions ahead of time. Please feel free to use the Q&A feature. We'll try to get to as many questions as possible. And what we'll do after the talk is we'll briefly let um, the panel maybe ask a question or two uh, or provide a feedback to the talk and then we'll go ahead and just get into your questions. So with that in mind, uh, we're just excited to hear from you. So thank you again for being here. I have really bad posture. So um, let me just adjust my screen uh, so that you can actually see me. Um, I just wanted to say thank you, Branko, and thanks to the University of Michigan for inviting me to join you today. This is one of the best programs in the world and uh, Branko, I know you're a giant in our field. Um, we're just pleased to have brought several of your uh, students into Xylem recently, including, I think I see Jackie and a couple of others on the call today. So uh, it's great to have you here as well. Um, I will be keeping my remarks uh, brief because we have two great panelists, Barry Liner and Ting Lu, who are real leaders in our sector, and I'd really rather hear from them. So uh, I'll just close by saying thanks to all of the participants on the call from Xylem and from industry. That said, my remarks are really focused on the students who are on the call today. Uh, we all know you've had a rough year and we're all here to support you however we can. So um, whether it's me or anyone else that you see from Xylem um, in the attendee list here, feel free to reach out and connect um, because uh, like I said, this is all about uh, ensuring uh, our future and that's all of you. So with that, let me share my screen um, and you should be able to see a picture of a town. Um, 
Uh, we've all been trapped at home for a couple of months now. And so I thought uh, to start off this long weekend, I'd take us on a little trip. And this one starts uh, not actually in the city that's on the screen, but in an undergraduate dining hall in Cambridge, Massachusetts, back in 2001. Uh, I was a junior in college. And I remember walking into the cafeteria one day and bumping into a friend of mine who was having lunch with a really intense young man. And she introduced him to me and said, hey, Al, this is my friend Pete. He's one of the smartest people I've ever met. I was like, wow, um, that's cool. And it turned out that that young man was named Pete Buttigieg, and he later became the mayor of South Bend, Indiana, which is the city that's uh, in the picture on your screen right now. It's a city of about 100,000 people an hour east of Chicago, not too far south from where uh, many of you might be sitting today. And that was really the first time that I'd ever met anyone from South Bend, uh, and it wasn't my last. Right around that same time, there was another brilliant young man who had just moved from Peru uh, to South Bend, Indiana to undertake a PhD in control systems theory and engineering at Notre Dame. Uh, his name was Luis Montestruque. Now, Luis was taking all the kinds of classes that you're probably taking right now and which were and remain way above my head. Um, and remember that this was right after 9-11. And so there were a lot of aerospace companies out there saying, you know, you're working on control systems. Uh, we'd love you to develop algorithms for missile guidance systems. Wouldn't that be fun? But my friend Luis uh, wasn't interested in missiles. He really wanted to make the world a more sustainable place. And one day he found just the right opportunity to do that. Because you see, about 20 years ago, South Bend had a major problem. And that problem is similar to that of a lot of cities around our country, and that's aging infrastructure. The city's aging sewer network meant that about one to two billion gallons of sewage polluted water was being dumped straight into the St. Joseph River annually, mostly on rainy days. And the cost of a long-term control plan that was designed to manage that overflow had been estimated at about $860 million. And to put that number in perspective, you know, South Bend with a total population of about 100,000 people had a median household income of about $39,000 a year. So an $860 million cost burden was just not affordable for the community. So as the story goes, the director of public works in South Bend, uh, Eric Horvath, enlisted the University of Notre Dame to see if there was a better solution out there. And Luis stepped up. He used his background in control systems engineering to deploy a distributed sensor network in the sewer and an artificial intelligence-based control system to develop a new solution that would reduce the sewage overflows in the city by better managing the water infrastructure that the city already had. So Luis's solution, and I'll put it up here, created a digital twin of South Bend's sewer system that could autonomously optimize the operation of the sewage system in real time. Autonomous agents effectively trade avail available conveyance capacity through the system in real time like an underground stock market, routing wastewater to areas that have spare capacity and avoiding sewer overflows. By equipping the sewer system with intelligence and a degree of autonomy, the system has eliminated dry weather overflows in South Bend and reduced combined sewer overflows into the St. Joseph River by more than 70%. And the city's public works department, backed by a visionary mayor, Pete Buttigieg, and a brilliant engineer turned entrepreneur, Luis Montestruque, has saved $1.5 million in annual operating and maintenance costs and close to $500 million in capital work savings. It's an extraordinary example of how innovation in civil and environmental engineering, backed by strong civic leadership, can make a difference for America. And for the students that are here in the University of Michigan, um, it just shows that people like you and the people that you meet in the dining hall at school when you're able to come back can make a tremendous contribution to the world by thinking big and following your dreams. So let's come back to the present. Um, first of all, I wanna thank you all for the opportunity to speak uh, to all of you, some of the greatest minds uh, and emerging scholars in our country um, and our world about a topic that's really essential to our future, which is smart infrastructure. Now, Bronco has mentioned that the theme of this lecture is um, autonomy. And as uh, Jerry Lynch was saying, there are a number of other themes, frankly, that smart water connects to, whether it's adaptation, um, or the built environment. And if we're going to focus on autonomy today, I take that to mean, because uh, again, I uh, never uh, would have hacked it as a PhD student in your department, um, the capacity of an artificial agent to operate independently of human guidance. And so I want to briefly cover three points on that today. First, 
why autonomy might matter in water infrastructure, um, how those innovations may ultimately unfold in our industry, and then what U.S. students can bring to our sector and how to think about uh, making the best use of your time in an atmosphere and environment as rich as the University of Michigan. So first, let's talk about the problem that autonomy is trying to solve in water. And Branko mentioned that many of you know a lot about water, but some of you are really deep in autonomy or engineering and may not know as much about water. So I'm gonna start with some basics and we'll keep going from there. So if you think about the fundamental challenges that are facing any water manager in the world, right? It's kind of starting on the right-hand side of the chart. Just recall that you know, our bodies are 80% water and we rely on very low variability water access for our very existence. The human body can only survive without water for three days. And if water quality varies outside some very low tolerances, you can get diarrhea or even die, right? And so we've designed our civilizations and the infrastructure beneath them around an attempt to minimize the variability of water in all of its forms. So if you don't know the name of your water utility, or if people don't know very much about water infrastructure, that's in large part because we've been successful. And that thousands of people who have worked very hard have made this difficult work invisible to you. And what's really remarkable is just what an enormous amount of alchemy is required to achieve that degree of invisibility. It's a transformation in statistical variation from an extraordinarily high variance category of inputs whose randomness is growing, climate, temperature, biology, economic shocks, to the design objective of achieving low mean, low variance outcomes. And so this transformation from high variance inputs to low variance outcomes has to be accomplished in an era of increasingly dynamic change with assets that happen to be long lived and inflexible, people, equipment, poured concrete. The decisions that we take today as infrastructure thinkers are often literally carved in stone for decades and yet have to remain resilient to changing conditions whose uncertainty isn't easily reducible. And that leads us to the design challenge for resilience and for autonomy. Resilience can be thought of as the ability to continue to deliver on low variance outcomes in a period of increasingly uncertain inputs. It's about increasing and strengthening our ability to buffer variation. And the challenge is that doing so requires difficult trade-offs. So, if any of you have taken international macroeconomics, you'll be aware of what's often called the trilemma of open, economic, uh, open economy macro. Policymakers in macroeconomics like three things. They like fixed exchange rates, open capital accounts, and an autonomous monetary policy. But they can, by, by construction, only choose two of those three things. You can Google the trilemma of international macro later if you're interested. There is a similar trilemma at work in infrastructure economics. We want resilient infrastructure because we need to be able to adapt to changing inputs and extremes while we have aging infrastructure. But that requires significant investments to re restore our infrastructure and expand its capacity. We also like process stability. We like designing things in ways that we know already work. We don't like changing design principles or adopting new technology in part due to the degree of certainty we have in systems that already work today. And increasingly, we also have a budget constraint associated with the affordability and equity of infrastructure. Water rates have been growing two to three times the rate of inflation in many parts of the US, including the Great Lakes. And water infrastructure is broadly perceived to be too expensive in many parts of the world. Now, we've been in an unsustainable equilibrium where we've chosen uh, affordability and process stability at the cost of deferring maintenance and reinvestment, therefore making our infrastructure less reliable and more brittle. But in the future, that has to give way to a new equilibrium. And we have to disrupt that norm of process stability to achieve significant gains in resilience by improving capital and operating efficiency. And that's where autonomy comes in. Because we can't just keep building massive sewer tunnels to deal with peak flows of wastewater when you can save 50% of CapEx by adopting intelligent autonomous control systems. According to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, labor productivity in the water and utility sector has been effectively flat for two decades, despite significant increases in the availability of cost-saving technology. When you add to that the fact that we're about to see a major retirement wave in the water workforce, and you'll see why automation and autonomization are critical for the future. Moreover, if you think about climate, 
we can't continue to waste enormous amounts of energy in our water distribution and wastewater treatment systems at a time when affordability for costs and climate change are major crises in our industry. So let me step you through a couple of examples of where autonomy can make a difference. Now, water pipelines crisscross the ground beneath our feet. But as most of you know, utilities lose 20% to about a third of their water before it ever reaches the customer. And there's a water main break every two minutes in the US. One way to solve that problem is to replace your pipes very frequently. But that causes a lot of disruption and a lot of money. Furthermore, about 80 to 90% of the pipes that are replaced still have remaining useful life. So companies have developed advanced diagnostic and assessment tools ranging from smart bowls like the one here that have acoustic sensors and gyroscopes that float through pipelines and listen for leaks or full on robotics platforms that can crawl through pipelines and use ultrasonic or electromagnetic scanning to detect pipe wall loss. Now those platforms are far from autonomous today, but they can help human users leverage that data to find where problems are and focus resources much more effectively on the pipes that have the greatest risk and require replacement, minimizing the need to tear up perfectly good pipe. Now, another way to think about that and leveraging autonomous-based systems, now analytics-based approaches can ingest historical and environmental data to generate increasingly accurate predictions of pipe risk failure enabling the prioritization of replacement programs that can cut 70 to 80% off of the cost of managing the integrity of critical pipelines. So you don't need human beings to lay out and try to figure out which pipes you should replace every given year if you have a system that can tell you how to achieve the policy objective of reducing pipe breaks by automatically prioritizing the things that are most important. Now, on the other end of the spectrum, wastewater treatment plants are huge users of energy. And since you're all civil and environmental engineers, you know that the wastewater treatment plant in your city is probably the single biggest municipal user of electricity. And much of that power is just used to blow bubbles through your sewage in plants that look like the one on the screen, most of which is wasted. We've developed artificial intelligence-based control platforms that can autonomously optimize those tanks to reduce the specific energy required to treat wastewater saving about 20 to 50% of that energy while reducing greenhouse gas emissions. And finally, wastewater pumps are huge users of energy and can be a source of environmental hazard if they clog and cause pump station overflows. Now you have a lot of mechanical pumps all around the world, right? And people have to go visit them and check to see how they're doing. Instead, we've created largely the smartest and most autonomous wastewater pump system in the world. It has an embedded controller, drive, and sensors that can sense the optimum duty point, transforming a pump curve to a pump field, increasing the resilience of wastewater collection systems. Now, over the course of the last year, it's been you know, COVID everywhere, right? And people have started to use a lot more wet wipes and Clorox wipes to clean themselves. And they wanna get it out of the house, they flush it down the toilet. I'm sure some of you have done this, um, even if you um, are smart civil and environmental engineers. And a lot of utilities reported huge surges of clogs and callouts in their wastewater pumps. But one of the cool things is that in the state of Michigan, we deployed over 300 of these really smart wastewater pumping systems. And during that same period, because they were equipped with these autonomous systems, not a single one of them clogged during that period. And that's huge because every one of those clogs that didn't happen meant that a worker didn't have to go out there and put themselves at risk to pull out sewage, because at the time people didn't know if COVID could be transmitted through wastewater, although Wes and Barry can tell you all about whether that's risky or not in a moment. And those innovations are really important. Now, when you compare them to what's happening in transportation or in aviation, for example, they represent just the tip of the iceberg when it comes to the opportunity for autonomy. And it just so happens that while technology adoption in the water sector is notoriously slow, and this chart shows you kind of why it's taken so long, even for some basic technologies, to diffuse through our sector, we believe that innovation and adoption are accelerating as digital solutions reduce the cost of adopting new technologies and approaches that increase the flexibility of our assets. Now, if the 60s to the 90s were largely around model modeling and visualizing system assets, we believe we're now in a phase when sensorization and optimization are rapidly gaining, gaining traction in the industry. And while full-on autonomization is not yet a reality in our sector, there are forces that will drive it more quickly than ever before. These include a number of challenges that will affect water in your lifetime and mine. 
I know, because I plan to be around in 2050, and I hope most of you do too. Um, but unfortunately, a lot of the infrastructure we have today will probably be there too. And so we have to identify better ways to manage it. Now on this chart, which is from the World Resources Institute, you'll see water scarcity is projected to become a much bigger problem in 2050 as climate change and population growth intensifies. So we are going to have to tap new sources of water, including the recycling of wastewater. And I believe that autonomous systems will have a really important role in building public confidence in the safety and sustainability of recycled wastewater. And at the same time, more and more communities are seeking to drive net zero commitments, including in the water sector, which is a huge consumer of energy as we've discussed. And they're going to need to evolve to be either carbon neutral or even greenhouse gas negative. And autonomy will have a role to play there too, in terms of system optimization and making sure that those systems are not wasting water or energy that's embedded in that water as it delivers against human needs. So what does that all mean for you? Well, first, there are going to be tremendous opportunities for people with your skills and your insights to create impact in this sector. Remember that a lot of the best minds of certainly my generation went to go work for companies where they spent most of their days figuring out how to optimally place an ad so you will click on it. You can spend your time solving fundamental human needs instead. Second, those opportunities will take a lot of different forms, from startups to corporate roles. We're very fortunate to have been able to hire several students from this department over the past couple of years. But we've also acquired a number of startups that were founded by people just like you, like Luis Montestruque from South Bend, like Valor Water Analytics in San Francisco. We actually created a video about this, which you can look up on YouTube. I think you'll enjoy it. Um, it's only three minutes long. It's called Incubators of Innovation. And it's all about how university and utility partnerships can help create startup ecosystems that will allow really smart engineers like you to create companies that will ultimately solve problems in a really global and scalable way. But third, and finally, I think to prepare yourself to have the greatest impact in this world, we are moving into a period of greater and greater multidisciplinary value. Particularly in the field of autonomy, you're going to need to have a broader perspective on the ecological, social, and ethical dimensions of technology than ever before. As a publicly traded company that invests in a lot of sustainable technologies, I will tell you that environmental, social, and governance concerns are rising rapidly to the forefront of the discussions we have with all of our stakeholders, our customers, our investors, our people, right? And as we build autonomous agents that operate independently of human guidance, which is the point of today's conversation, in water and in other sectors, understanding how choices about where, for example, an autonomous agent will choose to direct investment or allow sewers to overflow will have consequences for things like environmental justice and equity that cannot be decided by algorithms alone. If you look at the multi-trillion dollar infrastructure proposal that was laid out by the President of the United States yesterday, you'll see that a lot of it wasn't about technology, a lot of it was about environmental equity, right? And so having a perspective on how the technologies that we bring to the market can solve those multi-dimensional, multidisciplinary challenges will be more and more important. Context, intent, norms, and politics will all matter more. And companies will need people who can be brilliant in technology, but also business savvy and increasingly socially conscious and aware. And that's true because at the end of the day, I believe that the sole purpose of leveraging technological autonomy is to expand the range and experience of human autonomy and freedom. And that's why our mission at Xylem of solving water is embedded in the premise that we're here to create a world where solving water means that water will no longer be a constraint to environmental sustainability, economic prosperity, or human health. And so when we think about autonomy in a multidimensional way, use the opportunities that you have at your, at your disposal here in a community that's as rich as the University of, uh, of Michigan to look not only at how you can look at you know, great algorithm development and embedded technology and sensor networks, but also in philosophy and ethics and environmental policy. And to that end, I wanna end on a call to action for you, which is Zion is sponsoring right now a global student innovation challenge. Um, university students, undergraduates and high school students are all eligible. It opens on Monday and there's a $20,000 prize pool for working on innovations that will solve some pretty um, important uh, water related challenges. Um, I'd invite all of you to participate and visit um, this website, um, which is um, at the bottom. Um, we'll also put it into the chat later so that you can get it. Um, but it's a great way to put your skills to work. You guys are the future. 
Um, I'm so grateful to have the chance to spend some time with you. Now let's go talk to the real experts who are uh, Dr. Ting Lu and Dr. Barry Liner. Thanks so much. Thank you so much, Al, for your uh, for your insights. So I, I think we can open it up to the panel right now. Um, so uh, before we take, feel free to use the question and answer feature on Zoom if you want to submit a question. As I mentioned, we already had some submitted. I just wanted to open the floor real quick briefly to Ting and Barry to see if they had either any questions for Al or maybe a remark about, um, about his presentation, um, if either one of you wants to start. <laughs> I will start here, Branko, and uh, thank you so much for having us here. And uh, Al is always a speaker hard to follow. I would say that first. Uh, so it's uh, Al really laid out the visionary. What are the opportunities are there is for autonomy and uh, things that uh, students are great opportunities in the world. And I see this is a really uh, great opportunity to integrate between the engineering, the traditional engineering we all know, and also the traditional what we're used to see from a water sector, the operations, how we make an impact, but layering that from the IT perspective. And I know, Bronco, you are that between the interdisciplinary, both from a computer science background and also the engineering background. So I see what's, that's what it needs needed from a skill sets perspective for the future students. Um, and I also want to just bring up, there is a connection between all of us and Bronco and the, how, how do we see we, we know there are already technologies out there for autonomy in other sectors, but why water sector is lacking? So a few years ago with Barry and Al, so we started this intelligent water system challenge and uh, the thought is how do we facilitate the adoption of the smart technologies? And uh, the big part we see the, the emphasis is on is making sure academic is a part of this. And we need the young, the bright minds to be part of this and solving real problems here. So um, the, with the first challenge, Branko, you're the first place winner with the University of Michigan, the team. So you guys have a great team and have a great vision and the leadership here. I just want to, um, Hats off for that, and uh, I'll let Barry to to speak here. And uh, <laughs> thank you for having me. Yeah, uh, thanks. I really appreciate the opportunity to con continue to collaborate with the University of Michigan. And um, I wrote down a, a number of. I, I've heard Al speak a number of times, and every time I still have a full pad of notes of. This. One of the key things is, and and I've had uh, we've had this kind of discussion with other with Glenn Diger, who's a, another professor over there, that what, what we need now um, coming out is really urban systems engineers of putting all the various pieces together as opposed to simply a civil or environmental or a, or a computer science and, and integrating that domain knowledge in, of the environmental and, and ecological space with the data science and the, and the analytical side and pulling all that together. And that's, first thing, as a former professor, I know that's darn hard to do in a bachelor's degree in the, with the requirements that we're at. But one of the, the key things that stood out from, uh, from Al's per, uh, presentation was he talked a ton about autonomy and everything, that's the main point. But if you, if you heard him, he talked about human capital. When he talked about the infrastructure, the long-lived infrastructure, the first thing we normally go to in our minds is pipes and plants, but that human is also a long-term and that's a critical part of the overall system that we need to bring together. And I will say the, uh, and then environmental justice and all these other things, it all fits together. And that's why we need that, the, that human element. And um, e e even talking about networks and all this, the human network as well. So. Just a year and a half ago, I was in, I was in Shenzhen, China, right? and I ran into one of Bronco's students or co collaborators who I was in the same room with in Montreal, Canada, two years before. And so, the the those those networks are not just in electrons; they are also are in the human space that we that we need to do in order to ensure. The, uh, the advancement of this technology and, and, and autonomy in, the, in our space. 
Thank you, Barry. Um, I just kind of wanted to follow up on that, actually. Al, I'm going to direct this question at Al and then kind of go around again. Um, you mentioned, you emphasized in your dis discussion the importance for students to take classes like philosophy rather than, you know, along with control theory and machine learning and stuff like that. We had a question submitted um, along the lines of equity, um, and I think this speaks to the environmental justice component that you mentioned. Are there, I mean, it sounds like there are concerns. What are the concerns as AI rolls out into the water sector? Are there concerns about um, equitable access to this technology? And if so, who's at risk and what are the kind of things that we could do um, to remedy that? So uh, maybe we can start off with, with Al. Sure, um, that's a complicated and very good question. You know, I, I think probably some of the, the uh, foundational concerns that people have with artificial intelligence have to do with whether or not we encode our own biases and preferences into the um, uh, algorithms that define how autonomous agents will behave. Um, there have been a lot of really good examples and good thinking about where that's happened. And I think, you know, from my perspective, um, it goes to the point of whenever um, you have choices that have to be made, um, there are usually some ethical dimensions to it that are difficult to model out in advance. You know, there's um, there's, there's the classic example of the rail car, right? Um, that's speeding towards, you know, a, a group of people and it can swerve in one way and kill one person and it can kill five people that swerves the other way. And, you know, the agent has to make that choice. And that's something that thinkers about autonomy in the transportation sector have been grappling with for a long time. You know, I, I think there are similar questions around how we encode decision-making about um, algorithm development for the optimization of infrastructure systems and water. So if you take a simple example and you look at choices around pipeline rehabilitation, right? And, you know, those pipes tend to be distributed throughout a city and cities tend to have un unequal distributions of populations that might have different um, uh, exposures to, um, to the quality of water service. And so, you know, it, it, how you set your objective function Right? and how you train your um, algorithm to determine what is the optimal strategy to um, reduce the impact of aging infrastructure will have distributional consequences which will be reflected in equity impacts in a community. And so um, you know, there's a um, dialogue that needs to happen between infrastructure operators and the designers of systems which generate decision support recommendations about you know, what assumptions are encoded into control parameters that guide decision-making about investment. Because fundamentally, infrastructure systems are um, so foundational to the experience of life in our world that inequities that are experienced through unequal service or unequal access can materialize in profound and persistent ways in other dimensions of life. And so that's one example about where there's a robust dialogue to be had on how you design a product. Right? How you build a system that leverages machine learning to generate an quote unquote optimal outcome. And the question then becomes optimal from whose perspective. Right. Yeah, that's a really great point. I'm wondering, I mean, Ting, you're, you know, from, from clean water services perspective, you know, we always have this discussion in water about it's a human right, people deserve access to water, but as water moves to be more kind of entrenched with technology. Now does access to technology also become a requirement along with access to water? So how, you know, from, from your perspective, like uh, when we talk about environmental justice and equity, like how, how, do you, how do you view that? Yeah, we're actively doing that. And it's a part we're in, uh, embarked on a DEI journey and to provide that uh, uh, water equity here. And it's a part is again with the autonomy and the, the, the visualization, the transparency of data that is to understand where the water access is, where the support or need from the uh, com uh, communities, especially around the pandemic, I think is expand the, what we see the water equity here. Um, so I think the first is definitely dashboard and visualization will help that. The second part is like what Al talked about is the criteria when you develop this technology algorithm. So what we are developing right now is this real time 
optimization of the to to help with the prioritize the project like water reuse and the, uh, what about the plan optimization or infrastructure project and also the asset management aging infrastructure so the policy decision needs to be set from a um, stakeholder perspective and then the technology is based on this criteria what we are level of service what we are trying to accomplish and then the technology will provide that decision support to help policymakers to make that decision there. Yeah, great, thank you. Um, you know, Barry, just on that note, you, you know, my friends of your travels earlier, but you, you meet lots of folks traveling internationally. And I think we see, I mean, all of you do obviously, um, but like, uh, I'm look, we're, if we look at something like COVID vaccines right now, which is really a technology really when we look at it right it really has become pretty clear that it's accessible to some and not others are there any viewpoints through your travels you've seen like um you know are some countries adopting it more and how how does international access to technologies kind of play out with with our shift to digital is it is it a barrier or is it kind of like an opportunity for when cell phones came out and actually that was the way to you know to switch directly to cell phone uh, as opposed to have landline to begin with yeah i mean that that's a that's a great analogy, but I, I think, um, uh, yeah, and that kind of is into the centralized versus decentralized um, debate, uh, or, or, and there's and there's no one right, um, one size fits all, right? Um, there's one no correct answer, and it needs we need to have that um, discussion, uh, and it goes back to Alice's point about optimization. For example. If you are optimizing where to lay the pipes and for distribution and collection in the in the city, and there's a it's a gap in an area, maybe that gap could be better um, served by through descent distributed infrastructure, you know, which is going to need control systems and 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 all that autonomy as well. That also comes back to the to the human right side of thing that that Al brought up. So, just a quick side note: I used to when I used to teach. I, there's uh, the UN um, uh, Human Rights Declaration. There was a there was a push about ten years ago to get Article 31 that no everyone has the right to clean and accessible water adequate for the health and well-being, and no one shall be deprived of such such access or quality due to individual economic circumstance. And the thing is, I would always pose this to my class, and I said, Do you, "Would you vote yes for this?" And the thing is. That's not a yes, no question. It is a philosophical question because if everybody who says yes, I'm like, well, okay, who's paying for this treatment? Who's paying for the transportation of this? Who's paying to clean that up? And if somebody says no, I'm like, what are you, a heartless son of a gun that you don't want people to have water? It's, it's not a binary thing. So you, you having that philosophical environmental justice and that kind of thing. Um, so that th that education is going to be very helpful to actually decide whether to use distributed infrastructure and autonomy versus centralized infrastructure and even optimization within that. So, um, you know, we're working on a project uh, right now in in uh, Alabama and the Black Belt. We're having an innovation hack through the Unleash program um, to try to solve some of the challenges of failing septic systems in that in the in the poor areas of the Alabama Black Belt. You do not have to go overseas to try to find challenges. You know, okay. they exist here, local to yeah. us. Yeah, thank you. Um, you know, you just mentioned something and it's actually directly related to one of the questions that was posed. Um, so I'll read off of it. But in your in your talk, Al, you were, you, were, you mentioned variants of inputs and variants of outputs, and that using that as a definition for how we look at water um, systems. Um, as water systems get more intelligent, if you will, and more responsive, uh, this idea that Barry was talking about about decentralized versus centralized. I mean, oftentimes, you know, when we it, it appears, and this is not like a philosophy we discuss when we teach about water. When we teach, we teach equations oftentimes, but. It seems like we build large centralized facilities as a way to get around this issue of needing to control variants in lots of different places. So as, as we look at um, the role of technology, do you, what role do you think that'll play in, in potentially distributed water solutions? Um, and is that, even, you know, is that even something we should be considering? So I'll ask, I'll ask Al and then I'll go around again.
let me unmute myself. It's a really good question, and it's um, not one that can be answered um, uh, quickly. Uh, but what I would say is that you know all of the choices that we make around centralization, decentralization, and interconnection uh, involve trade-offs, right? And those trade-offs aren't ones that we can make um, categorically. For example, you know one of the trade-offs that people uh, have always thought about um, with respect to connected assets is digital connectivity and the increasing risk of cyber intrusion, right? And so there is one trade-off that says, you know, given that we had systems that were tightly air-gapped from anything digital and we're migrating them to a more and more digital world, does that expose us to greater vulnerability and does that make it um, uh, disadvantageous for us to um, uh, try to reap the gains of automation? And I think that's a short-sighted view because I think there are always risks in infrastructure systems and it's a matter of mitigating them in an intelligent way. Um, and sometimes the solutions that um, we think are safe are actually not at all, right? And so that's one trade-off. I think another trade-off is you know, the connectivity between centralized and decentralized systems permit different levels of service, Fireflow being one of them, you know, the ability to deal with the variations in um, water supply in another. And so you know, I think they're highly specific to context, which I guess is part of the point. Great, thank you, uh, Ting. Like on that note, uh, you know, are how do you view decentralized solutions? Um, you know, I know stormwater, for example, that's being considered now, but I'm wondering what some analogies are for water treatment. Do, do you think that's viable, and do you see do you see technology playing a role in? in definitely, in yeah, definitely. I, I think technology play a huge role here. It's a part technology really can help is look at optimization. Let's say. Let's make, make the assumption that decentralized solution makes sense from business case evaluation perspective. I see it's really having this big data and, and analytics and in a database at the regional perspectives, because a lot of challenges are similar at the regional basis. But if you have all this data and the monitoring devices and in the same cloud database, and then you can look at, oh, this is what's coming. And this is where there is an issue is for the other one. So it provides you an optimization at the regional level. So that's what clean water services have. Uh, I mean, we are centralized uh, treatment, but we have a different uh, treatment plans and all these treatment plans are interconnected. So there is a ways to offload biosolids to a different place. And then we can hydraulically connect it to avoid like uh, the, um, the surcharge or things from that standpoint. So that's what I see the um, technology place. Uh, one of the things on decentralized system is that uh, we want to think about also cybersecurity. If the technology is going to be used to autonomously manage and um, the treatment solution, how does that going to be uh, supported if there is a cyber attacks or if there is a, just even simple like a power outage or thing. So it's very important to have a feel safe measure there just to making sure at the end of the day, the outcome is to improve water quality, sustainability and all that. So I'll just uh, leave from here. Yeah, actually you mentioned, you know, one of the first things you mentioned when you were just talking, if it makes sense from a business perspective, which was actually a question that was just, um, that was posed on here as well, um, particularly dealing with what are the opportunities for innovative business models um, to increase the adoption of these technologies? So we have these technologies right now, are we kind of pushing them out the same way we were doing before? Here's a new thing and let's adopt it at the rate that we usually do, or are they innovative business models? Um, you know. Ting, you're adopting them, I and mean, I'm kind of curious to hear uh, uh, from Barry also. Um, so, like, Ting, real quick, what you were talking about, that, like, how do we pay for these technologies um, to sort of speed up the adoption, if that's something we want? Yeah, I think the part is that um, if we want to speed up, and is how do we co-create the solutions together? A lot of times we come... Uh, we, we came being asked and oh we have a technology what what how can we solve your problems right and then some of the AI solutions is uh, they they want to work and then we need to validate the data we need to validate the model and see how the AI solution works for utilities so what I suggest is to when you have an idea and I talk with the utilities and I'm always very intrigued with the the, what what the idea is and uh, so from a utility standpoint and also just the industry standpoint and what is the, 
the existing systems we have. So there is a, uh, already legacy systems or existing platforms we use. So let's making sure the solutions you develop is going to directly fade up to a utility and plug into as a part of the system and infrastructure. Yeah. Um, Barry, do you mind, you know, letting us know what you think about business models and how we can get there? Uh, yeah. Um, well, definitely the first thing is to validate, validate the, make sure you have a, a solution that's not looking for a problem, that there's a problem available. And the, you know, looking at the, the big picture, for example, um, Bronco, I remember one of your presentations before, it, we're talking about decentralized stormwater. And if you, if you operate each dis distributed uh, systems independently, you can optimize each one of those, but then you cause a big problem downstream. So you got to manage them centrally and decentrally at the same time. And, um, and so the, that, that's a, an example of have, making sure that you're validating a problem and looking at the big picture. And I will say the other, the other thing on this. So um, we get to see a lot of startup companies coming through open innovation, uh, um, through Imagine H2O, through things like Al showing that Xylem's doing. And it's not, while there's some huge, great success stories and, and business models and talking about, you know, um, Christine Boyle, who started at UNC, moved to, moved to San Francisco and, and took her PhD dissertation. And then now is with Xylem and, and Luis Montestruque and doing that, going that way. But there's also opportunities for entrepreneurship at a, at a company or a utility to actually apply the same things, find the problem. And your business model can even be internal. It doesn't have to be you know, I, I want to go look at data as a service versus well, whatever other kind of model. You, you right. can actually look at, it's really about finding a problem that needs a solution and then applying to that, whether it's going out there entrepreneurial, entrepreneurial, both ways work as well. Yeah, so it's actually running with that question. You just mentioned, you know, one of the, I guess, product dev 101, don't build something nobody wants, right? Like. Right. Al, could you give us an insight on business models from Xylem's perspective? What role does product development play in the company? And how do you how do you engage with folks on the ground so that the final business model actually serves their, their needs? Because I would imagine the money, the money will come if you identify a clear, a clear need, right? And so how do you go about finding those needs as a, you know, as a as a large company? Yeah, I, it's a great um, question because, you know, certainly um, after the first wave of startups that we saw kind of, you know, four or five years ago, we saw kind of this Cambrian explosion of um, work happening where it was almost like people would take different buzzwords and then different problem statements and then just mishmash them together. So we had like blockchain for everything, right? Or, um, you know, uh, subscription services for, you know, all kinds of things that we didn't need. And, um, you know, it, that, that question of defining, you know, end user needs as the recipe for a successful solution is, is foundational. I think it's a mix of two things. One is um, we try to look for an obvious and quantifiable economic benefit that's created by the, uh, the solution. So if somebody can point to a spot on a customer's P&L or capital budget and say, by doing this thing differently, we can point to that line and say it's going to go down. That's always a big plus. And the other is also a lot of um, voice of customer. King is probably tired of taking my phone calls asking her, uh, you know, what do you think about this, right? But, um, you know, we do talk a lot to thought leaders in the sector, um, operators in the sector, and ask, you know, does this idea make sense to you? Does it resonate? Or is it just the kind of thing that we think is fun and interesting and cool that no one will ever buy? And there are a lot of those latter um, things um, in our sector, and there are a lot of those former things in the sector. And the only way to find out is to ask and to engage. Yeah, I mean, I wonder if to some extent it means we should, beyond philosophy, and some of those classes also introduce some design thinking into our engineer curricula to sort of get them to understand user needs. Um, we only have five minutes left now. We have lots of questions, and all those asking questions and pre-submitted. If we didn't, if we didn't pick yours, I'm sorry. There's a lot of them, um, and also some of you students will be in the Q and A afterwards for that smaller group, so you might be able to ask them there. 
Um, I wanted to end on one that you all mentioned at the beginning, which was like kind of crossing, crossing this bridge between, let's say, academia and industry or academia and utilities to try to sort of um, accelerate the adoption of, 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 of these things that are discovered. And what comes to mind is like, you know, certain other fields like the tech industry, like tech tech, where they, you know, might have a conference, somebody has an algorithm and it's implemented tomorrow and running on something. And I'm not saying we got to shoot for something like that, but, you know, with the four minutes that we have left, I'm just curious, um, get all of your thoughts on these competitions really do seem to play a role, the one that you mentioned earlier, because I know our students did that and they ended up um, with your company. So I'm wondering, like, how do we bridge um, this acceleration of innovation to, to, to actual implementation. So I'll just, I'll just throw it to the group and see what you all, what you all think. Maybe we can start with Ting. I love this topic, Branko. And uh, I, I think the part is really just like Elsa, let's keep, the, keep talking. And uh, I love to collaborate with the university on proof of concept and saying, how does this work? And uh, really to help uh, make it to the four skill implementation there. So that's what we are here for. Yeah, great. Ooh. Barry? Yeah, so um, yeah, exactly. Take advantage of, of innovative utilities like Ting, or it doesn't have to be utilities. It could be industrial water, there's industrial water needs and, and wastewater needs as well. But, but partnering with them to actually validate the, the your, your solutions and, and challenges make sure they're meeting that and that's the quickest way because we are in in a long-lived infrastructure environment we're not making apps that yeah. we can make a billion dollars on in six months you know we it's a long much longer term so so partner with the with the people who are actually do this for a living every day and make their lives easier yeah and Al, I think you all work with universities, is that right? We do, we have um, an advanced technology and innovation program that has um, uh, a lot of partnerships with universities that are doing innovative work. Uh, we also participate in a lot of you know, consortia um, to um, you know, work around NSF funding, et cetera, to try to accelerate things like smart water. I just want to amplify what Ting and Barry said. You know, when we looked at a lot of the different startups in the sector, one of the things that discriminated between ones that were likely to succeed and ones that uh, were still kind of on their way is having a really strong anchor partner, whether that was a utility or an industrial customer that um, was helping them make the case for diffusing that technology elsewhere. And so finding that first um, use case advocate um, ambassador for what you're doing um, is probably the most important thing because it'll help you, um, you know, nail whether there's uh, somebody who likes your product and likes it enough to help you spread it everywhere else. Yeah, great. So I think our uh, our time here is coming to an end, and there's lots of questions that were submitted. Again, um, you know, sorry if you if you didn't get your question answered. Uh, I will actually get the panel to just do a quick quiz before we leave. There was a lot of questions submitted, and one was right at the top. And you've been talking in smart water systems for a long time, and it, do you want to just guess which one it was? Because it's usually the, when I give talks on this, it's usually one question that always pops up. That's, you know, autom autonomy might be coming to water, but what about this topic? Any guesses? It's security always pops up. I'm not the one that, you know, not like it's always the one that that pops up, I think, no matter how we talk about these new technologies. So I think, um, you know, that's one that I think comes up so often. I, I, it was really interesting to hear from your perspectives, notions and equity and some of these other things that we don't discuss that much. I just want the audience to know that we didn't ignore that question. It's a very important question that we have to, that we have to address. You know, my personal perspective is that we shouldn't be scared of new technology. We should learn what benefits it provides and then weigh that against the other things because risk exists in doing the old business model as well. So, um, you know, so um, I think we're at, we're at 2 p.m. here. So I just wanted to um, just thank Thank our panel and thank Al for his um, great presentation. Um, it was really great having you all here. Um, I appreciate it. I know the students really appreciate it. And uh, you know, we have this recording for posterity um, for us to share in classes and disseminate widely. So um, just thank you. Um, thank you all so much for, um, for your time. And uh, I think with that, uh, we're, we're good to go. So thanks so much. <laughs>